Good afternoon. My name is Matthew McKellar, and I serve as Associate Professor of Preaching here at Southwestern. And I want to take this time to thank uh, those of you who are uh, partnering with us in our preaching partnership at Southwestern. It has been so exciting to talk to a number of you and to communicate with you. And I want to thank you for the difference you already are making in the lives of our students as they have the opportunity to come and preach and uh, bring God's Word to your congregation and to be encouraged and to be built up. So uh, on behalf of uh, the preaching department and on behalf of Dr. Patterson, our president, uh, thank you. It really means a lot. Now, the purpose of this short video today is simply to help you in the process of evaluation. One of the things that we have spoken to partner churches about is that you want to have a select group of lay people. It might be as few as three or four people. It might be as many as seven to ten or twelve to fifteen people. But basically a group of people that you train in terms of how to evaluate a sermon. And what I want to do is take just a few moments today to walk through a sermon evaluation form. In fact, this is the very sermon evaluation form that we use in our classrooms at Southwestern. And I thought for the sake of familiarity and for continuity and for consistency that it might be wisest for us to use the evaluation form with you in your churches as you evaluate our students that we use in the classroom. So. I want you to know, uh, pastors that are a part of our partnership, we're glad to make this sermon evaluation form available to you. If you don't have a copy of it, feel free to email me anytime and I can send you the electronic version of it that you can copy off and run as many copies of it uh, as you would like. But as you evaluate the sermons of students who come out to preach, uh, there are uh, ten categories specifically that you want to pay attention to. I want to walk through those quickly. Uh, so that you can kind of get some insight into how we evaluate sermons at Southwestern and how you can best be equipped to help our students when they come to preach at your church. First of all, there's the matter of introduction. Now on our evaluation form, there are three little reminders under that section, introduction. Does the introduction orient us to the subject? Does it raise a need and does it identify with the congregation? Basically, in the introduction, what you're looking for is does the preacher in an attractive and in a creative way connect you to the text? Now, many times what we encourage our students to do here in class at Southwestern is to begin the sermon with what we call a now illustration, a contemporary illustration that might be something from history five years or even a hundred years ago or maybe something uh, that happened in the news last week but something that is that is uh, more recent than biblical times a now illustration that ties into the text itself so what you're looking for is something that raises interest you're looking for something that attracts the attention of the listener and that immediately relates you to the text of scripture let me also remind you that a good introduction shouldn't be too long. In a 30-minute sermon, the introduction should rarely, if ever, be more than 3 or 4 minutes or 10 to 15 percent. So as you listen to introductions, ask yourself, is it short enough? Is it connected to the text? Is it interesting? Is it creative? The second category is what we call the main idea. Sometimes we call it the central idea of the text or the thesis statement. We believe that text-driven preaching should have a fundamental unity. So one of the things you want to be listening for is what we call the main idea or the thesis. That is to say, you want to hear the sermon summarized in a single sentence of about 20 to 25 words. For instance, if I were preaching from 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, Paul's thorn in the flesh, my thesis or my main idea might sound something like this. Because God specializes in displaying strength against the backdrop of our weakness, you can rejoice in the midst of your unplucked thorn. In a single sentence, I just summarized that entire text. You want to look for a succinct, crisp, clear main idea from the preacher. Now, in some sermons, it's going to be important that that main idea is heard early in the sermon. For instance, the sermon is is uh, very deductive, propositional. Think Romans 12, 1 and 2 where Paul tells us what we should do, present our bodies, and then he, then he expands on that. A lot of sermons need to follow that same structure. 
in that case, the thesis is going to come early in the sermon. Now, with other sermon forms, different genres like a parable or an Old Testament narrative, the thesis might come after the, the text is dealt with at the close of the story and at the close of the sermon. For instance, in the parables of Jesus, you don't get the main idea in the first verse of the parable. It comes usually at the end. But wherever it comes in the sermon, you want to walk away feeling as if you can summarize that preacher's sermon in a single sentence. That's what you're looking for with the main idea. Third, we move to the issue of structure. We believe at Southwestern that text-driven sermons should have a text-driven structure. We don't want our students taking three points in a poem and slapping them on every text. If there are two key thoughts which support the main idea, then you have a two-point sermon. If there are four, then you have a four-point sermon. So pay attention to the structure. Is it faithful to the text? Is it easy to follow? Does it reflect the type of literature from which the preacher is preaching? So that's structure. Then next, explanation of the text. I suppose of the ten things that I'm going to mention, nothing is more important than explanation of the text. You've heard it said in the realm of real estate that the most important thing in real estate is location, location, location. Well, I would say with preaching, the most important thing about preaching is explanation, 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 or content, content, content. One of my concerns about much of preaching today is that it's very little in terms of textual preaching. That is to say, too often preachers select a text, they read from it, they say uh, four or five words about it, and then they launch into a series of anecdotes and illustrations and stories. Now, they say things that are true, say things that in many ways are helpful, but you never learn more about the text. In a text-driven sermon, you learn about the text. So, as you listen to these sermons, as you think about the preacher's explanation of the text, ask, ask yourself, do I understand this text better after having heard this preacher? Do I understand it better? Am I more aware of what the Bible is saying and what the applications are for my life? Are the major issues of the text explained? For instance, if I were preaching Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, I would deal with commands like present your bodies a living sacrifice. I would deal with issues like don't be conformed, but do be transformed. So you want to be listening for the preacher to handle the key words in the text. If he doesn't talk about the text, if he doesn't explain what the words in the text mean, then you need to encourage him to stick with the text or stick to the text. Explain the text and the preachers that you hear should point you the te to the text again and again. You know, one of the things that uh, makes for strong preaching is when we go again and again to the Bible. What's important is not what I think or what the preacher thinks. What's important for us is to take people to the place where we can say, the Bible says, here's what it says, here's what you do. And so explanation of the text is so important. Next, illustrations, illustrations. Now, illustrations can be overused, but they can also be underused. I like what Charles Spurgeon had to say about illustrations. He said that they should be an adornment to the sermon. They should shed light, just like the light coming through the windows of a house. And that's what an illustration should do. Let me remind you that illustrations have no value beyond their capacity to shed light on the biblical text. So as you listen to the illustrations that your preachers use, Ask yourself, does this illustration help me understand the text better? Does this shed light on the text itself? Is the illustration interesting? Is it, is it woven into the fabric of the sermon itself? Next, we move to the issue of applications. We want our preachers to apply the truth, and we want them to apply it with specificity and accuracy. So if they're preaching a text that has to do with submitting to governmental authority, for instance, in some of the uh, Timothy patches, passages, also in Peter's writing, submit, uh, submit and recognize the authority of kings and rulers, well, then the application in that sermon would, would, would want to focus primarily on how we relate to earthly government as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. So listen for application that flows out of the text that is specific 
and not just broad. Too often in preaching, preachers make the mistake of, of simply saying things like, you need to pray more, you need to love one another more. Husbands, you need to love your wives. Good application flows out of the text and anchors the truth in the daily lives of hearers. So ask yourself, did this preacher anchor the truth in the daily lives of, of his audience? Uh, is the truth concrete and specific? Next, we move to the category known as style and oral clarity. Your preacher ought to have as his goal to have the capacity to paint vivid word pictures through the use of, of carefully planned language. He should uh, avoid poor grammar. His word choice should be very careful and purposeful. That's why we encourage our preachers to write out the sermon manuscript. We don't want them taking manuscripts into the pulpit, but we want them to be so well prepared that they have written a manuscript and then they can go into the pulpit and they have confidence that they can be articulate and that they can use the proper words with clarity and careful expression. So you're listening for style. Are transitions used effectively? Is sentence structure correct and helpful to understanding? Is there proper restatement? Is the preacher presenting himself in a winsome manner? You know, Charles Spurgeon in his lectures to uh, his students uh, wrote of the winsome quality that the preacher should have, a certain winsomeness where you want to listen to him. His style is authentic and transparent and real. And so you're looking for that. Next, we look at the use of the body. Well, communication specialists tell us that when the verbal and the nonverbal are in conflict, that an audience will gravitate toward the nonverbal. They'll believe the nonverbal over the verbal. So what we want our preachers to do is with their gestures, uh, use those gestures in a way that is consistent with what's coming out of their mouths verbally. Now, one of the problems that we as preachers often have is we uh, use too much uh, uh, in the way of our hands and gestures early in the sermon. We don't leave ourselves somewhere to go. Or there's nervous movement. For instance, a, a preacher can, can fiddle with his wedding ring or uh, he can stick his hands in and out of his pockets and it becomes a distraction. The goal with the use of our body is to preach in such a way that listeners and hearers don't even notice what we're doing with our bodies. They're locked in on the message. So as you watch these preachers, ask yourself, is he doing anything with his body? Is he standing too still like a statue? Is he walking too much, pacing the floor where I, where I can't focus on what he's saying? Is he using his hands too little or too much? Ask yourselves those kind of questions and you'll be able to give good feedback in this area. Well, the last one is the issue of vocal production. Now, when it comes to vocal production, you want your preacher to speak in a way that at his softest, he is still audible. He can be heard. Sometimes preachers fall into the trap of getting down there in what I call that still small voice. It's so still, it's so small, it's so quiet that you can't hear the preacher. On the other hand, there are some preachers who think that effective preaching equals volume and maintenance of volume over an extended period of time. What we try to tell our preachers at Southwestern is leave yourself somewhere to go. You don't start out at full maximum volume. You leave yourself somewhere to go. You want to be sure that your preacher is uh, aiming for variation in rate and pitch and volume. You want him to avoid being Matthew Monotone or, uh, or, or the guy that gets up there and is so soft that you cannot hear him or on the other hand who is so loud that he almost blows you out of the room. So be listening for, uh, for adequate sufficient volume but not too much volume. Then listen for articulation. Does the speaker speak distinctly? Sometimes preachers in their rate of speech speak so rapidly that their articulation is compromised. You may have to write to some of these preachers uh, a message like this, Preacher, you did a good job. I appreciate your enthusiasm, but slow down and articulate so that I can understand what you say. Then the preacher should 
pronounce words correctly. This is particularly true when he is reading from the biblical text. When the preacher reads from the biblical text, he should be familiar enough with his text where he doesn't stumble over the words, where he pronounces the words accurately, and uh, that's not a distraction in the least. Well, one final thing. On the back of this evaluation form, there is a final section, and it has, in the first place, a section that says um, strengths. I want to encourage you to jot down at least a couple of the preacher's strengths and encourage him. And then it has another section that uh, addresses areas in which the preacher can work. And I would encourage you there to also offer some constructive criticism, to lovingly yet clearly communicate areas where the preacher needs to work. This will be a great encouragement to these preachers. Now let me offer one final word. I want to set you at ease. We don't expect uh, you and the preachers who preach for you will not expect you to fill out a novel here and fill in both sides of this. All we're asking is that you give reasonable feedback, that you give constructive feedback. Of course you don't want to just check everything and a check mark here and there and, and write good job. We want you to spend some time and really give some good feedback for our preachers. It'll be such a blessing to them. But this is the evaluation form that we use and I wanted to run through these 10 uh, these ten categories. Well, that pretty much covers it. And let me remind you, if you have any questions at all about our preaching partnership, I want you to feel free to contact me at any time. Matthew McKellar, my email is mmckellar at swbts.edu. And I would love to correspond with you at any time. And I want to be available to help you in any way we can. So now, I want to say thank you again for your partnership with us and we look forward to working with you now and in the future as the Lord gives us that great privilege together of raising up the next generation of preachers across the United States. Thank you. Have a great day.